I came back, I believe it was 84, and did the angle with Tito, broke his leg. This was before I even knew about WrestleMania, but then it started. And George Scott, my booker from Carolinas, he always used to say he thought up the name WrestleMania. I don't know if that's true or not. I don't know why he would lie about it, but uh, he was Vince's right hand man along with Pat Patterson too, who just passed away. So, yeah, you WrestleMania one, you knew that was going to be a big deal, and they got Liberace coming in there and Cindy Lopler and. Billy Martin and Muhammad Ali, and, and I got to meet all these guys. And uh, Muhammad Ali, by the way, other than George Foreman, was one of my favorites. I love George Foreman, too, especially in that comeback when he was 50-some years old. God, you knew. You knew you were on a, setting on a big, big thing. And that was the first pay-per-view for WWF back then. I heard that they put so much money in it. This is what Georgia told me, Scott, that after they paid everybody and boom, 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 and, but they branded their name, WrestleMania, that they really just broke even. Then after that, of course, they made a ton of money. But that first one, they, sh they went for the gusto and, and it worked out, you know. Were you ever worried at this time when Vince McMahon was taking talent from a lot of the promotions, did you ever have any threats of being blackballed if you went there? Well, I went to Vince and I asked him why he was doing this. Why are we going to LA? Why are we going to Dallas? Why are we going to all these other places that, that these are territories and, and these people I work for and they're friends of mine and promoters. And he goes, Greg, he goes, my, my, the WWF is set up to be nationwide. I'm not trying to put anybody else out of business. I need to go nationwide, not just the East Coast, you know, between Baltimore and Bangor, Maine, and Pittsburgh and Buffalo. He was just really in that area, Philly and Baltimore. He goes, I need to go nationwide. And he, and he got, he went around and, they didn't give him this TV time. He went and bought TV time in California and Illinois and everywhere. He was set up to go big. He had to go big. And you know what? I understood it. And it wasn't like I'm going in against my friends. And he also told me, don't worry about going anywhere. You're here forever. And I basically was there for a long time. Um, you know, you feel a little bad about it, but, you know, he explained it to me that this was a nationwide thing. WWF, and then it became a worldwide thing. So it's all good. It's all good. Can you talk about the transition from working with Vince McMahon Sr. to Vince McMahon Jr.? You said you had met him the first time at the Garden, you said in 1975. But now you're back here almost 10 years later, and you're working with him, the son. What was the difference between the two, the father and son? Well, Vince Jr.'s cocky. Vince McMahon Sr. was one of the nicest guys you ever, and down-earth guy you'd ever meet. And he loved his talent. And he was almost too nice. He hated, he told me, he had to let somebody go. And he goes, Greg, you know, it's just, it's hard for me to tell somebody they got to go. He told me I had to go, but he gave me a starting date nine months later where you can come back. So it was in and out, in and out. But certain guys, uh, like Stan Stasiak, you remember that name? Yeah. He says he was the hardest guy ever. Uh, I, I told him he had to go. So he was just a real soft-hearted guy. Now, Vince Jr. was a little different. I mean, he was, he's a chip off the old block, but he wasn't as sensitive as his dad was. His whole generation, but he, he was, he still is intelligent, son of a gun. And, and uh, he put this whole thing together. He knew what he wanted, along with Pat Patterson and, uh, these guys, they they love the business too. So, 
different personalities. You know, I used to make trips with Vince when he was still the announcer, but when he came, he came to boss, he had to, I understand this, he had to distance himself from the guy. You can't just, I'm not just a TV announcer, I'm the boss. So he was a little hard to get to. You had to make an appointment or whatever. Chip off the old block, but his dad was a, a sweetheart. So that was the difference. When you're riding around with Vince McMahon Jr., which everyone knows now is just Vince McMahon, basically, the newer newer generation does. Mm-hmm. Do you guys ever talk about any plans about when he would when he would take the company or if, if he was going to take the company or what vision was for the future? Did he ever talk about anything like that? No, we just had a good time drinking driving and, and talking and we're just getting to know each other but his dad he died because something it was something to do with he got cancer of the prostate or something I'm not sure exactly what it was but something down here and he knew he had a limited time on earth left I remember we always had a dinner every three weeks and he he invited a lot of the top guys I was always part of that, me and the Grand Wizard and stuff. And he knew he only had a short time left. Like, there's something wrong with his, I don't want to say what it was because I'm, I'm not sure, but because of health, he passed away. And uh, that's when Vince, of course, took over. He was ready to take over though, you know. Yeah. Do you have anything you want to say to all the fans and the new fans that are now watching from these interviews and the A&E stuff that are now discovering Greg Valentine? Yeah, well, if you haven't if you haven't watched my career and my matches, it's all over. Uh, besides these these YouTube interviews and stuff, I'm all over the place. Some old stuff from the 70s, wrestling with Flair, wrestling against Ric Flair, wrestling with Wahoo, all the stuff from Tito and Beefcake, the Dream Team era with the Bulldogs and the Rujo brothers and then the new dream team and then then the rhythm and blues thing and then all the stuff I did in the independence. But uh, yeah, if you're just getting introduced to me, you know, you got a lot of material to watch and I hope you enjoy it because I worked my yin yang off and I enjoyed every minute of it. I loved it. Second generation wrestler. I think you know, Wahoo, like I said, Wahoo, I wasn't all that tough when I got into it, but Wahoo beat me till I became tough. All the great matches I had with Tito, you got to watch those. And uh, Ronnie Garvin, I love the Slugfest. I have a Ronnie Garvin and, and it hurt, but I loved it. I'm going to be out soon. Can't wait to get out there and meet all my fans on a personal basis at the Comic cons and wrestling conventions, when they open that all back up, it'll all be good. Can't wait. Thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure, and thanks again for you know doing this and, and sharing so much of your time and memories uh, with us at Title Match Network and all the fans around the world. Oh, yeah. Man, I thank you, too, for getting in touch with me. And, and uh, this has been a, a real pleasure, and I hope we can do some more of it. Go back to the WWF days. There's just a guy you brought up in one of the interviews. Billy Jack Haynes from Oregon? Yeah, I don't remember having a lot of matches with him. Him and Ivan Putsky had tagged a few times. It might have been in tag matches, yeah. I think you guys have worked yeah. as the dream yeah. team maybe against So him. we had a lot of, they shot, they would shoot a lot of different opponents our, our direction because, you know, Wyndham and Rotundo, Wyndham quit and then Rotundo was there with Dan Spivey and, and so... You know, we'd mix it up and we'd work with the Rujos and we'd work with uh, other teams and the Hard Foundation, all these different, because everybody was after us for the belts and st- until we, we did the thing with the Bulldogs. So, Don't remember a lot about Billy Jack. Um, he ended up getting fired. There was this thing going on that uh, guys were... It was some kind of a, I forget the name of it, but uh, guys would drink it and it would make you pass out. It was a fat burner. H um, something? I, I, know, I, yeah. I know what you're talking about. You scoop it and then you... A- H something. GHB. That's it, yeah. GHB. So it came in a can 
and it was really you weren't supposed to get have a trip off of it or get high off of it, but you would take it and it would make you burn fat, supposedly. I don't know if it ever did. But one of the first times I ever did it, Honky Tonk Man gave it to me. And we're on an airplane, we're up in first class, and he says, here, take some. So I took it, and uh, on an empty stomach, and it made me pass out right away. And I think I it passed, the lady, the stewardess came to give me my breakfast, and it was a long flight, one of those coast-to-coast -coast jobs, and Honky said I was passed out and I was drooling. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, GHB, so, Get back to who were we talking about? Uh, uh, Billy Jackings. Yeah, so he did that on an airplane, uh, but he didn't have Honky Tonk Man covering for him and waking me, waking me up. The pilot, or not the pilot, but the stewardess thought, oh, there's something wrong with this guy. He was all, and they couldn't wake him up for breakfast, and he was drooling, and they kicked him out, or they took him off the airplane, and then they, they, uh, Vince found out about it and fired him. So he was kind of hard to deal with, and there was fights in the dress room and stuff. There was this, you remember the name Iron Mike Sharp? Oh, sure. Great, real nice guy. I hope he's still living. He's in Canada, but I, don't, I think he passed away too, but I hope not. Anyway, he used to hit guys really hard out in the ring. And this was at the, in the garden. Billy Jack didn't like that so he they went through with a match out there but when they got back in the dressing room he punched him out bam bam and billy jack tough guy right he punched poor uh, iron mike sharp out I and mean, he was a great guy he didn't he always and if he threw a hard punch it was across the chest it wasn't in the in the face right or neck or anything and he knocked his block off and uh, so to speak and uh, so that got some heat on Billy Jack and then after that he got fired after doing the GHB and drooling on the airplane you know so they actually were they had to make a they thought something was really wrong when he was having a heart attack or something so they had to land the airplane and take him off and Vince was aware of with GHB because he had all these stooges that would, these guys are taking this and they're getting high off of it. And I don't know who ever found out you could get buzzed on it. You're supposed to take it before you went to sleep. But if you took it in the daytime or the morning on an empty stomach, you'd get, you'd buzz out. But the deal was you'd try to stay awake. And I remember Honky saying, come on, Greg, stay awake, enjoy it. And I'm trying to stay awake, and I went. <sighs> but he woke me up. He covered for me because my breakfast came there, and I was drooling a little bit. Otherwise, it might have landed the plane for me. So this is another story I want to tell you. Please. It's on the GHB thing. Bobby Heenan, God rest his soul, too. He uh, did the GHB, and he was up in first class. And he did it. And he's flying from Tampa, or excuse me, from New York back to Tampa, where we all lived back in the day. And he passed out. And when the plane landed, everybody's getting off the plane, and he's still there, and he's drooling. And so they wake him up, and he wakes up, and then the police take him, and they go through his bag, and they found a, a little bag of marijuana. Back then, you know, now it's legal. Back then, it was, you know, it was a misdemeanor, and I don't think he got charged with it or anything. They, they just took it away from him, and they probably went back and smoked it. <laughs> but he got in a little trouble for that, but they let him go. It was no big deal. But I, Bobby actually told me the story, and uh, it was no biggie, but uh, that stuff was bad, so guys quit taking the GHB. I didn't like that. The feeling was, you know, if you could stay awake, it was like, you know, uh, you know. Yeah. Lots, a lot easier to smoke a joint and hold it in. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Your good friend Paul Orndorff recently passed away. I know you guys go way back. Could you just tell us a little bit about your history with Paul? Well, I, uh, 
we were on the first WrestleMania together. And also, I was around him uh, in the Mid-Atlantic area when when he came up with, uh, boy, he tagged up with different people against Flair and myself when we were real strong into the tag team championship world. In the NWA, all over the place, Paul was like, he was still really green, but he would hook up and he would like give me that football stance thing, you know, where he keep, and he wouldn't, you know, he was hard to work with because he wouldn't loosen up, you know, and then finally, after he got tired a little bit, he would loosen up, but he was so strong. What a great athlete. And he, he finally learned how to relax and he was just, he was terrific. Paul, you know, had a bout with, uh, with a throat cancer and he survived that, you know, and he lost weight and stuff, but he survived it good. And, uh, so it just, it's really, uh, heartfelt and I feel really bad for the family and I feel, and I, I'm, I'm missing, you know, I'm missing Paul and I'm missing a lot of guys lately, but they all went up there. I'm confident. The wrestling heaven and sky. God bless Paul Arndo. Mr. Wonderful. Appreciate he wore one of the Olivia jackets, too. I think he had a couple of them. I saw him. They keep showing him that. Maybe he had a couple of them. He could go crazy like, like I did. But, yeah, Mr. Wonderful. Atlanta, Georgia. The Brandon Bowl. Great. Let me just say one thing. When I first met Paul, I was working out of a place in Tampa called Harry Smith's. It was just an old time muscle head gym, no frills, you know, not like a gold's gym or anything like this small, perfect equipment. You go in there and get a good workout. And that's where I met Paul Ornda. And uh, he came up to me, nice guy. God, he was built. But he was playing football and I believe college football, high school football. He really didn't mention wrestling, and then, uh, then all of a sudden he, he got into it. So, God bless Paul Arndo. Just wanted to throw that story in where, where I first met him. And like you said, you guys worked all the way from there uh, to the you know the first WrestleMania, the first few WrestleManias. You guys worked on together. Yeah, he had that Kirk Douglas look with the cleft chin, so he had a great body. Brandon Ball. Okay, WrestleMania 2, I don't remember who he wrestled with. You know, I... It was Morocco. Okay. I remember. Yeah. And he was around on 3, I believe, right? I don't I, I, I don't know if he was on 3 or not. The, I've, I've read and it's been said that he was actually considered a backup for Andre the Giant in case he pulled out of the show against oh, Hulk Hogan. Do you right. hear anything like that? No. Yeah, you hear so much stuff. I don't remember him being in... I'm sure he was there somehow, or he got paid anyway, because he he should have been there. There was a skepticism about whether Andre is going to be healthy enough to wrestle Hogan, and uh, you know, because he was in a lot of pain. That was before he did the Princess Bride. So, like you said, I was a backup. I didn't hear that, but could very well be. We talked beforehand about just some of the guys from this era, but we talked about Bobby the Brain Heenan. Can you talk about your relationship with Bobby Heenan and what he was like backstage? Well, I first met Bobby Heenan when I was wrestling for Dick the Bruiser with Don Fargo. And uh, he was wrestling, and then he became a man. He would wrestle, and then he'd come out and manage somebody, and he always took those bumps over the top rope. He took bumps like Ric Flair did. And uh, very nice guy, always very smart guy, had a beautiful wife and daughter, and just a great guy. It's so sad what happened to him, you know, getting the cancer. And, but a lot of, a lot of good trips with Bobby the Brain Heenan, and he was the brain. He was a great commentator, he was a great manager. Never had the luxury of him managing me, but he, he, he managed all the greats. What a talker, what a guy. Lived in Florida, eventually moved to Florida from Minnesota, and uh, great guy. 
You know, I was always a big fan of like Gorilla Monsoon, guys like that. I loved Monsoon. I loved when I would hear Mean Gene and Monsoon doing the commentary, or even Vince. You know, it was Monsoon and, and Gene Oakland, and Gorilla was just a great guy. He was a great guy. And his son, tragic what happened to his son who got killed in a car wreck, Joey Morello. But I remember he got in a ring one time, and this is in the early 80s, and Monsoon got in a ring. And I'm trying to get out of the corner, and he, and he had me locked in the corner. Wait a minute, you're not going nowhere. So I remember that, just faintly remember that. But after that, he was always commentating. And he was just a natural. He was so good. He was so good. And Mean Gene was, well, that's what he was, a commentator. But Monsoon was, was great. Gorilla. I'd seen that he was a special guest referee for a couple of your big matches. Right. Like with Backlund and uh, Pedro Morales. Yeah, that's that could have been... Maybe it wasn't wrestling him, but I know he was a referee and he kept me blocked, <laughs> wouldn't let me out, and I could not get it. I couldn't go anywhere. That's one strong guy, real strong guy. Another great guy, always been a great friend, was Cowboy Bob Orton. And his son, Randy, he's great, so he's third generation. Cowboy Bob was second generation. We became great friends. I helped him. I introduced him into the Mid-Atlantic got him into Mid-Atlantic. He started, Flair saw how he worked. Rick wanted to work with Cowboy Bob right away. And then they we got him into New York and the rest is history for Bob Orton. He was another second generation guy that just was great. Because I met Bob, I got him booked in the Mid-Atlantic. As soon as he got into Mid-Atlantic, Rick, I, I tell Rick, you know, this guy here, and right away he did a angle with Bob and they started going all over the place. And then we got I got him into I says I went to Vince Senior. I said, This guy's great. You gotta bring him up. So Vince Senior was he was getting away from his houses were bad in 78, 77, because not knocking the guys who were there, but maybe they'd been there too long, but it was too much pulling hair, fingers in the eyes, uh, not solid work, not wrestling. You know, it's like showbiz city. And he wanted people that could wrestle. And I think once some of the guys that came in before me, so I came in in 79, but it, he was starting to pull guys out of areas where guys in the South mainly that knew how to wrestle. And one, this guy came, Ken Patera, I'm speaking of, he came in before I was, I think it was 78. He started that transition into, you know, more wrestling. So I came up and then Piper came up and Sergeant Slaughter came on up. And uh, so it was just, it was different. It was, we're making the people believe in the wrestling again. He wasn't selling out the garden anymore. They brought me in. I didn't have a wrestling hold. All I did was backwards suplex somebody and dropped a big elbow. Vince McMahon Sr. come up and he says, have you ever thought of using the figure four leg lock? Wow, I don't even know how to put it in, put it on, but yeah. So I had some guys show me right back there in the dressing room how to put it on. And Vince knew how to get someone over, he came up to me and he goes, when I get through with you, everybody's going to know who you are, Greg Valentine. I wasn't the hammer yet. So I went out and started. We did three tapes in Allentown, and we and next night, we this is in Pennsylvania, then we went over to Hamburg and did three more tapes. And every guy that I wrestled, I put the figure four on him. And they would carry him out on a stretcher. They had ambulances coming in. They had everything. And this went on for three months. I'm flying in out of a 
Charlotte or Florida, I think it was Charlotte, yeah. And <clears throat> every three weeks I'm up there. So by the time I went to the garden, I'd been on uh, television like 16 times and they see this figure four thing. So now I'm wrestling Bob Backlund and it's a snowstorm and I'm driving from Charlotte with my wife up there and we can't even get to, to New York. So it's a blizzard. But it finally stopped where I could get take the side roads and get to Manhattan, get to my hotel. So I panicked. I called Vince Sr. And he wasn't even there. He was at home. He goes, Greg, don't worry about it. It's already sold out. So that was a good feeling. So I went out there and they told me what they wanted to do. Um, they wanted, it's never been done in Madison Square Garden before. We want you to go to a time limit with Bob Backlund. I've never even, I shook Bob Backlund's hand and talked to him at the tapings, but never wrestled Bob, nothing. And I heard he was extremely hard to work with. But, you know, I went out there, did the hour-long Broadway match, 1979 or 80, whatever it was. First time I ever wrestled Bob, we did the hour long, and it turned out being fantastic, fantastic. And and, and shout out to Bob Backlund because that, that was a great match, hour long, never been done before, and it it was just as good as winning a world belt. Actually, came back and I think we we did another one. First of all, we went all the way around. We only did that that hour long match one time, but uh, we went pretty much 45, 50 minutes on all of them. And we came back and I eventually, uh, you know, he got over on the second time around. But then I did a thing with Chief J Strombo and it was his idea. He went to Vince and then he came up to me and he goes, I'm gonna have you break my leg on TV and I'm going to have him carry me out on a stretcher. Now, I didn't know back at the time, but the, probably the, the the most the biggest guy that had the most fans and everybody loved him was Chief J. Strombo. There was Bob Backlund, the world champion. They had some other guys there, Pedro Morales, whoever, but they loved Chief J. Strombo. So when I broke his leg and did that, in Hamburg, one of the TV tapings, and Gorilla Monsoon came out with a stretcher and he had the doctor and they had the ambulance back right in and carried him out. And I tell you what, I got so much heat, couldn't even hardly get to my car. People believed everything back then. And then two months he's gone and all of a sudden he shows up at the TV tapings and He's out there watching me wrestle, and they build it up great. And no matter, you know, I, I wrestled him two, three times around the horn, everywhere, sold out. Small towns, big towns, you name it. We had a great run. And Chief was a great guy, beautiful guy. He always called me, he became, <laughs> later on he became an agent. I don't know, a lot of people didn't like him as an agent, but I did. And he always called me Beautiful Greg because I always would be back there going like that. With my, he says, Greg, you're beautiful. <laughs> I love Chief J. Strong. We made so much money together. I had money pouring out of my pockets. Back then, we got paid cash every night. We didn't have to wait for a corporate check. Money. Money in the hand every night. I love that. Cash every night. Wow. That's Panther. Who doesn't love cash, right? Yeah. I'm in Las Vegas, the home of cash. <laughs> we like cash here. Yeah. What do you remember about King Kong Bundy? I was shocked when I was supposed to do it. I, I was in Frankfurt, Kentucky or somewhere at a Comic Con and, and he was supposed to be there and we found out he passed away. So all the years before that, Bundy was... And Honky was part of that. We'd always sit in the dressing room and 
laugh and kid around and he had a good sense of humor and I'll never, this sticks in my mind, so I'm going to go ahead and say it, was my experience with Bundy, because I never wrestled him, right? He was a bad guy, and so was I. So I remember on this long-ass trip, thank God we were in first class, and Bundy's in the aisle, and I'm over here in the window, and there's the bulkhead. So Bundy's trying to sleep. I can't sleep, you know. I'm trying in and out of sleep, you know, and it's, God, how long is that flight? Six hours or something? So I always kidded around with Bundy. And so I'm thinking him, I think he, he's asleep now, so I'm looking at him and I go, I'll clean my language up if it's a little worse than this. I'd, you, I say, you fat son of a bitch. And he'd be like, I said, you're a fat son of a bitch. And he'd go, he'd, fuck you, Valentine. And he'd wake up right away, but he'd act like he'd never, it was like he wasn't even asleep, but he was like in a trance. And then another 30 minutes go by and he'd go, you're a fat son of a bitch. Fuck you, Valentine. The whole way to, Los Angeles from New York. Just funny shit. But for some reason, that sticks to my mind. We might have been coming out to go to WrestleManias. Or we were always on going on West Coast flights together. And I'd always tease him. And he liked it, you know. Really miss him. You know, you guys worked the second WrestleMania together. I mean, you worked on a bunch of shows, obviously. Yeah, but, yeah. I mean, that was probably one of the bigger ones. Well, he was in L.A., with uh, Hogan and uh, Brutus and myself were in uh, with the Bulldogs were in Chicago. So three different sites that they came out of New York. It was wild. It was wild the way they set that up. You know, Piper and Mr. T over there in Nassau, and then we went on and at the Rosemont, and then L.A. at the end. I'd like to see that whole thing again sometime. That'd be fun to watch that. Ozzy Osbourne with the British Bulldogs. Johnny Valiant, God rest his soul too. He was there with us. The only thing I didn't like about that match is we lost. <laughs> and we were supposed to get the belts back, but it never happened. So We chased them for another year. Sold out every place because our matches were jam up and jelly tight, stiff, friggin' matches, and loved every bit of it. Hi, this is Greg the Hammer Valentine, WWE Hall of Famer and legend. I just appreciate you all watching Title Match Network, and please subscribe because we got a lot of good things coming up. I appreciate it. You knew Big John Stud? Yeah. Back in the day? Can you tell us what he was like? Because I know you tagged with him too a couple times. Oh, he was a friendly guy, quiet, mellow guy. When he first broke in, he was in Charlotte with me and Flair, and, and he would, we would always go over. To, Flair had a gym at his house and opened up the outdoors, and John would come over and work out with us. He even had Stan Lane over there, and Flair always had to have a lot of people around him, and, and uh, he liked that, you know and working out and keeping in shape. And rather than going to the gym, we just do it at Flair's house. So it, it was great. And uh, I remember John, he would work out so hard that he would go around the corner and throw up. <laughs> so he always had some kind of issue with his stomach. He would actually turn purple a lot of times. So I don't know why, you know, but... Uh, he was basically a, a quiet man, had a big John stud, you know. I mean, who wouldn't believe in that guy, right? The thing with Andre and him would, would have done so much better if John hadn't, do, hadn't put his walk in the entrance and put his, you know, he'd walk over the top rope like Andre did. And John should have went through instead of him doing that. But I, I don't know. That pissed that pissed Andre off, so um, 
Once you piss Andre out, then nobody likes you. So I felt bad for John Stead back then. Yeah, but he did. He had a, he had a good career. He had a good career, and it could have been a lot better. You don't steal the thunder from Andre and say I'm the real giant. You know, these interviews that we did, we made them up, or they would. Back then, they didn't give you a script to go on. You just made them up, and you've been in the business long enough, you knew how to get heat. But you don't want to get heat with your opponent. John Stubb would go out there and say, I'm the real giant. And he'd walk over the top rope like he was the giant. You're not the real giant. I mean, if he would have went to a different approach because Andre didn't like being called that he wasn't the real giant. You know, some guys, some guys don't get it. So he could have ran, ran those promos a different way and cut Andre some slack and go through the ropes instead of stepping over the top. Ask anybody back in that era. So once you got on, who, who in the hell? I was there in the garden one time. John Studd's coming out of the ring, and then Andre comes back, and he yells at Vince. He goes, that's it. I ain't never wrestling him again. I'm finished. And, you know, Andre says he's finished. Who's, he gonna, who's John Studd going to work with now? I mean, I, I think John just quit. So it's sad, sad ending. I met his son. He's got a nice son. I remember his son used to bring him around. And I met him, and I think his son was wrestling independence. But, you know, it was a sad, sad ending for John Studd. Roddy Piper, A&E biography just came out. We were talking about it a few minutes before. How did that whole process come about? And uh, what was your reaction to the piece itself? Well, there was a fellow that contacted me with from New Jersey, and uh, he was like independent for WWE, but he was still working with them, and uh, said he was interested in coming out to my house in Vegas, and, and uh, he was also, at the time, Roddy Piper's wife was uh, living in Las Vegas, too. So, so that was done two and a half years ago, before the pandemic started and shut everything down. So they recorded all that stuff. I had just... I was uh, out here only about six months in Vegas because I moved out of Florida. Been there for 30 some years. So I was brand new to Vegas and, and he, he came out and recorded all this. So that was two and a half years ago. And now the uh, biography is on A&E, finally. There's a lot of other stuff that I'm doing that's, that's coming out but uh, with, with those people. But with that one guy from New Jersey, it finally came out. I think it started on uh, the 24th of uh, April, yeah. Or maybe March, I don't know, April. So they came in, they, they did the interview. I saw they had this, the shot where they set you up and right. you were watching the dog collar match back and everything like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they brought out their own DVD. I, I had them, but uh, so, you know, it was uh, it was wild watching that. I've watched it before, but I, I kind of stay away from it because it's such a brutal match. And we were so young and so dedicated, and, and Piper was such a great guy, and he let me, you know, I always work stiff, and I always, and he put up with it. And, of course, he he beat me hard, too. So you could see that the, there was no pulled punches, and, and you're working with a, a truck tire chain where they wrap around, I mean, God, this this chain was huge, and then of course the dog collar and the f fur that he stuck in there. <laughs> what was really a lot unusual? People think that you know you you plan all this stuff out. We did. We talked about it for 20 minutes. He snuck over to my side of the dressing room in Greensville Coliseum. We were separated. Good guys, this the heels over here. 20 minutes we talked it over, 
just a few spots where we jerk the chain like that. The rest of it, swear to swear to God, all ad lib, period. We didn't even we we knew who was going to win it. He was going to go over. It was a U.S. title match, but my my belt wasn't on the line, and uh, it was really the whole thing. Plus, the finish was ad lib too. We just we went for it. So, did you guys plan for something different before that, and then you you heard the fans and you switch it up on the fly, or how did do you remember how that worked out? I guess so. You know, um, it, it's hard to listen to the fans when you're. You know, I, I'd look at them like in matches that, with a slower pace to it, but this is like constant going. So you're not really, you're not really listening to fans because you know the fans are gonna explode with this thing too because he's bleeding and I'm bleeding and I'm beating on his ear and and uh, so it was just a brutal match. I don't know how long it lasted, 45 minutes maybe, 40 minutes. Oh my God! So all my matches back, especially in the NWA Mid Atlantic area, I there were always hour long matches or forty five minutes or something. I, I never went out there for ten or twenty minutes unless it was on television. Back then we had studio wrestling and and we also did rest, uh, TV shows out of different. Uh, like Spartanburg, there was an auditorium there, and it looked good on television. But uh, shorter matches on television, of course, because you only got an hour max, you know. When you relived that match and you watched it back, and then you saw the piece that the that they ended up doing for Piper when it was all packaged and put together, mm -hmm. what was your reaction to the biography itself? How accurate was it? You know, what what did you think of it? Well, of course, I wanted my part to be longer. But I guess it was long enough. I mean, it was covered good. I just thought it would have been longer because, but then they had Piper's daughters with segments and, and his wife with segments. So I understand how they pieced it together. But, you know, I felt my part was initially a good part. Like I said, it should have been longer. <laughs> Can you take us back to that first Starcade? It was, you know, really the first of its kind at the time. And, yeah. you, and you guys were basically the feature aside from the Flair and Harley race. Flair for the goal was the main event, and we were, it was a double main event, and they had some tag team matches there too. It was a good card from top to bottom. We knew that this is, you know, this is before WrestleMania 1, so this is the very first time. Now, it wasn't beamed to the homes because homes weren't getting this kind of stuff yet, but. Uh, you had to go to like a, a theater or like in Charlotte, there was a place called Park Center and different places, different venues where it would be broadcast, you know, you know, with a satellite, how they did back then. And it was all over the Mid-Atlantic and, and Virginia and Georgia, and West Virginia and parts of New York. A lot of people got it. So. It was beamed out, first ever uh, pay-per-view type thing before WrestleMania 1, Starcade 83, first one ever. And it was a big thrill, you know, you you know, you know, um, realize that you got a, instead of just 20,000 people in the Greensboro Coliseum, you've got a million people. Or I think, I don't know what it figured out to be eventually, but... Uh, it was huge numbers. We mentioned the Islanders earlier. What was your relationship with Haku and Tama? I, I love both of those guys. And one time... When the Samu? I, what was it? One what time I'm trying to chop Haku real hard because that was my thing. He chopped me so fucking hard I thought I had a heart attack. <laughs> And I couldn't breathe, and I tagged out, and I go, I'll never go into a chop fest against him again. He's a tough son of a bitch, but we love both those guys. We, we got a lot of, we had to take a few bumps, and, and they hurt us a little bit, but it was all good. I see the Islanders, I go, oh my God. Oh, that's yeah. when, I, when I broke into the business in the 
late seventies that the Samoans Tough were the, the Samoans were the guys that mentored me, helped yeah. that helped help me why and, came out, and looked looked out looked out after me. You know, yeah, there was guys tough. when guys would talk might, might take advantage of me and shit like that. They were they stepped up. I said no. No, no, no. <laughs> and they teach you to drop tool holes so you can take them down. And and you, them. you know, and they helped you. And they, you know, because it was, there was, I, you know, I, I spent probably at least seven years bouncing from every territory in the country. And, you know, there was, in the early years, getting get my ass pounded by people. And, and be only because... I didn't know any better, and once some good friends took uh, took me aside and started to give me a little instructions on how to take care of myself, then all that stopped, and then it was a whole different era it was for me, you know. Because I mean, these people, I thought, oh, you know, you gotta, you know, when you when you're a young guy coming up, you gotta do whatever they tell you. You gotta, you know, it's, it's cool, a cool. haze, a hazing almost. Yeah. Sometimes it's a haze, they haze you and stuff. And for sometimes for many years. But I mean, ask Greg, he, he knows. I wrestled against Wall, went down here a bunch of times, but he'd end up getting all fucked up a time or two in the ring. And, and he wouldn't want to sell me. And, and, and he hurt me and chopped me in the face and shit. So we're outside one time wrestling or fighting in Norfolk. I should say fighting. Or Hampton Road is one of those places. We're actually fighting, hitting each other. And so I just hauled off, and it just came out of the blue. I don't think I'm a tough guy, you know. I, I'm not, you know, I'm not like that fucking idiot that burned gun. I just want to <laughs> wrestle and make money. So I just hauled off and hit Wahoo as hard as I could, but it just came from no, nowhere. I didn't plan it, and I knocked him down on one knee, and I go, shit. I could fucking hit, and I didn't even know I could hit. And then later on that night. He, kept, he comes up to Julie, my wife, he says, you got one hell of a man. <laughs> he kept on going. So he liked the fact that I stuck up for myself. That's what it takes. He stuck up for himself. Well, Wahoo, NFL, oh same God. thing. I, I, I wrestled Wahoo too. Yeah. And then because my relationship with Greg and, and it, the whole thing, I already had a kind of almost like a built-in thing. Wahoo, I he. He was with me. He was fucking like a night off. Yeah. He it was. It was amazing because he, uh, Greg, and I had a relationship, and, and I knew that him and Greg had, had some battles, oh, and yeah. I mean fights. But I think shit. I think it's because he used to wrestle my dad a lot, Johnny. And too, yeah. So you know, he's he's paying former me. NFL football he player. He went to with Johnny shit. Valentine, so he's beating me up. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, I nailed him. Oh, but that's you know. And that's what he he understood that yeah. brother. That that that's what he you know, said. So he always he, 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 he would ask people people to ask him at comic cons where he says, uh, and I, I he would say that I I would tell everybody that Wahoo said that, and I would say this. And I think I'm getting it turned around right here. I would say that he made me tough because he beat me, and made me tough. He beat me so much, I finally became tough. Hit me across the face. I said, "Fuck this! Damn it!" Oh, boom! Uh, and then, then I really got respect wow. for Wahoo. And from then, from then on, if a guy was giving me a problem in the ring, I knew I had to punch. It would work. You know, it worked. And the word gets around. They go, "Oh, oh fuck! Red Mountain doesn't knock Wahoo with Daniel. You better be careful." I actually had people scared to wrestle me. <laughs> Little old me, you know. <laughs> TitleMatchNetwork.com Did you ever hear the Iron Sheik tell this story? You and him and Mullah in the car? He talked about it on the radio? He talked about it on the radio. <laughs> I just want to verify if this is correct. but Now here's what happened. She, she was up front with me and I'm driving. Sheik's in the back and I can't remember who else was in the back. Just another wrestler. I can't remember who it was, but uh, Sheik lit it. So we just been on a long ass trip coming from United States somewhere and landed in Calgary, rented a car, had to smuggle the weed in, you know, cause weed was bad 
in Canada, you know, you had to be careful. And so he's rolling up a joint back there and she's looking like, you know, she could smell it, but it wouldn't lit up yet. And finally, she lights it up and then he, and he passes it to me and I take it. And then immediately, but she's sitting up there with me, but she's over there by the front window, uh, by the right window there. And she's going like this. Oh, and then, she, and then she rolled down the window and then, fit, you know, just a little bit, right? And then the sheet goes, what the fuck are you doing? Don't let that smoke out. That's precious. You fucking bitch. You know, and he was, he, he went off on her. And so the rest of this, the whole rest of the way, we, we, I felt bad for her a little bit, but I said, give me another talk. And then we put it out and. I felt bad for her, but she, the whole rest of the trip, we're not even smoking anymore. She's still got the window popped, and she got it like this. Another 100 miles, she, she went like that. <laughs> yeah. He said that uh, she didn't talk to him for like 20 years after that. Yeah. <laughs> Something. <laughs> well, she always used to come up to me, because she liked my dad, right? And she says, come here, boy. And she put her lips out like this for me to kiss her. And I go, ugh. But I do it anyway. I give her a little peck. I go, oh, no, not this again. But I felt bad for her, you know. But she was, I guess, I heard a lot of bad stories about her later on, what she did to those, those girls. And, and I'm, you know, I'll just leave it at that. I don't want to talk about the dead. But, but personally to you and your father, you guys all got along, or she she liked you a lot. She liked my dad, so she always wanted to come around. I had to give her a kiss, but that was that was a funny that was a funny trip. And the sheik the sheik is so funny. And if you fucking pig, don't let our smoke out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh. And it was funny too because when he rolled that joint up. And I, I can't, you know, we, we we snuck it through the border and we're, we just really want it, right? And he lit that joint up and he's going, and the smoke is flying everywhere. And she's like, her eyes are ready to pop out of her head. What the fuck are you doing? You're letting the smoke out. Funny shit, man. Oh my God. Funny shit. He was on our stern for like four hours back in the day. It was in the 90s or something. I saw it on YouTube. But yeah, he would he would tell everybody that when he first came over from Iran, that I was the first person that showed him how to smoke a joint. I believe it. Yeah, he blamed me. <laughs> That's okay. I didn't teach him the other stuff. What was your reaction backstage the night that him and, I guess, Hacksaw were pulled over in New Jersey? Okay, that. so I, I heard about it, you know, it's telephone, uh, telephone, telegraph, and telewrestler, you know. And I heard about it, and I was out west somewhere. I heard about him and Hacksaw getting pulled over by the Jersey State Police, and they're bad. And I guess they found pot. I think they might have found some cocaine. I'm, I'm not sure. I know I know pot because they were smoking them when they got pulled over. And I think they let them go. They just gave them a ticket or maybe they went, if they went to jail, they got out, right? And still made the town, but it hit, it hit all the wire services. <laughs> and they, the sad part about it, but it's funny too, is they were wrestling each other and they had a big thing going. So I remember two days later we're doing TV and we're in Buffalo, New York and everybody, everybody is called up to this meeting room upstairs in the auditorium and Vince is up there, you know how he goes, or, I'm Vince McMahon Hacksaw Duggan and the Iron Sheik will never wrestle here again. Four months later, they were back on the card. 
<laughs> They'll never wrestle here again. How dare they smoke a joint going down the Jersey Turnpike? <laughs> yeah. Maybe it's because he got his 30 day. we're doing 30 days straight with no break, and he had to have some kind of fun, you know. That's what I'm thinking. But they all got called up there, and, and they said, but neither one of them have a job, and they are fired. Six months later, they're back. Yeah. Yeah, didn't, I remember Hacksaw was back. Uh, the only guy they never bring, that they, excuse my bad English, the only guy they never brought back was Nails. You also worked with a young Rick Root in Charlotte. Oh, my back, God. Back in the early 80s. Yeah. Do you think anything stick out to you about this? He was really, I guess, really green at the time before the whole rap. Yeah, one thing that really sticks out, and it's kind of X-rated a little bit, but I... I used to do that backwards suplex. This is before I, I started using a figure four. So that was my finish. Backwards suplex and then drop the elbow. So uh, I guess according to Rick, and he told me this four or five years later when I saw him in New York, and he was green back then. And I suplexed him backwards, and I almost lost him. Because that's kind of a dangerous suplex. But he had his head tucked in, tucked in, thank God. But I busted his nut. Now I X-rated, I mean X-rated because I ruptured his left nut. With the suplex? Yeah, I don't know how I did it. He had to go, go home and get it fixed. <laughs> and he told me about it years later. And I did the same thing to Owen Hart, but it wasn't suplex, it was like I was, I hated doing those running back and forth and they were doing the leapfrogs, leapfrogs. And I was trying not to make it look too obvious that I was ducking under. And one time, I don't know, Stu Hart said I didn't, I didn't uh, go down deep enough. So I clipped his left nut too. But what was really unfortunate for him, he, he, he lost his left nut because of that. Wow, really? And then I remember seeing Stu Hart at the Cauliflower Alley out here, and he was he was in bad shape, and he was in a wheelchair and everything, and he go, eh, eh, you uh, you busted Owen's nut, eh, and like, <laughs> I go, you're, and I never heard about. It. I go, oh my God, I'm so sorry. And you know, Owen's passed away now, and it's really sad. And uh, but yeah, so the. I guess I was a nut buster for, you know, I, I had to share that with you. It could you have know. been a good gimmick if the hammer thing. Yeah, was. the nut buster. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, both of those are accidents. And Rick, Rick, uh, Rick Rude, he's no longer with us either, but uh, he was okay after it. And he's the one who told me a story about it. And then Owen, of course, told me about it. But his was more severe, so... Oh, I'm sorry. And then, yeah, you later worked with both of them in, right. in the WWF. Yeah. yeah. We did a lot of, t uh, I don't think I worked with Owen in any any uh, single matches, but tag matches, yeah. yeah. I know you have a lot of respect and go way back with the Hart family, you know, for, for years. Oh, years. absolutely. So. Absolutely. Brett's a good friend of mine, and uh, I'll never forget those years of training in the dungeon in the early 70s with Stu Hart, classic stuff. And I, a lot of people say, well, what did Stu show you? And I go, he really didn't show me anything. He showed me how to relax. And I kept hooking up and hooking up, and he'd show me how to fall. But he didn't show me the high spot things, and, and I didn't want to learn that stuff anyway. But uh, I learned how to fall backwards and, and the basic stuff, which is really, really good stuff to learn yeah. and the hip tosses and the slams that that all came later and I worked out with a few guys in a gym there in Calgary away from Stu's dungeon but um, I got a real bad I don't know if I told you this story but I got a <laughs> real bad case of uh, uh, 
some kind of fungus on my feet because I had no wrestling boots when I got there. And they finally found me some and brought my dad sent me up there with no wrestling boots. And they said, oh, you can get them when you get there. And, and uh, so I got some kind of infantigo, that's it. I got infantigo on my feet and I couldn't even walk. And I had to go to, to an emergency room and they scraped my feet and they, oh, and then they bandaged my feet all up. And then Stu always said that uh, eh, the kid had rotten feet. But it was from that rotten mat he had down there, and he never cleaned it off. And I got in for Tygo. I, I, I think I couldn't even walk for almost two weeks. It was bad. Oh, God. Yeah. All the sweat. and the I had to s- the lay there in that Calgarian hotel there. It wasn't that, that bad of a hotel, but, you know, it was boring. Yeah. Back then, you only had three channels on TV, especially in Calgary. And then you had a couple French ones. 